Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. This series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of the speakers work for some part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're going to meet Lieutenant Lauren Jarlinski and Don Petratus from NOAA's National Data Buoy Center, located at the Stennis, Stennis Space Center, excuse me, near Kiln, Mississippi. While we'll be talking to you about NOAA's buoys, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that our speakers today are coming to us from the Chada Yakni, or the lands of the Choctaw Nation. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe and the Wampanoag Tribe of Gayhead Aquina. I want to also extend a special thanks to our American Sign Language interpreters, Crystal and Brenda. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there is a box where you can write questions. You can go ahead and locate that now. You can also let me know where you're calling in from. Please let us know if you're a class tuning in and if there are multiple people watching, just let us know who's asking the question. We encourage you to ask them as we go, and I will be keeping track for the speakers who are gonna stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all your questions, but we're gonna to try to answer as many as we can. All right, Lauren, are you ready? I'm ready, thank you, Nicole. Let's go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our discussion about NOAA buoys and buoy deployment. So as Nicole mentioned, I am Lauren Jarlinski, and today I will be talking with you and to you about buoy deployments and the buoys that uh, the National Data Buoy Center manages. So my job title is a Special Projects Officer, and also on our presentation today and a little bit later on, you will meet my friend and colleague, Dawn Petratus. She will talk about buoy observations and the day in the life of a specific buoy. Uh, she is a physical scientist with the National Data Buoy Center. So I am currently a NOAA Corps officer and I work with the National Data Buoy Center. Uh, I've also sailed on a couple of the NOAA ships as you can see in these pictures here. But I got really interested in marine science in the ocean uh, as a child. I would go to the beach during the summertime with my family. I'd go to any aquarium that was in the area and I just really loved all the fish and the sea creatures and the ocean itself. So I, I pursued that interest and went to school at Old Dominion University where I studied physical oceanography. And now today you can see me as a NOAA Corps officer uh, working with scientists to help them collect their data. So the National Data Buoy Center, or you may hear me say the Buoy Center for short, we're located at Stennis, Mississippi, which is very close to the border between Mississippi and Louisiana in the Gulf, along, excuse me, along the Gulf Coast of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And you see the picture on the right-hand side, that's our facility. Now the Buoy Center supports NOAA's National Weather Service, and we provide ocean and atmospheric observations. Now, Questions. Go ahead and type your answers in the, uh, in the little question box. But question for you all. If you were to walk outside from your home or your school, what might you see, hear, feel, or, or touch when you go outside? Okay, guys. What do you think? Go ahead and write in the chat box. If you, if you walked outside right now, what are some of the things that you would see? Okay, so Raina in uh, Juno says water. Um, she must live near the water, which is nice. What are, the, what are some of the other things? Uh, Michelle says plants. Tom says wind. Mm -hmm. um, Wonderful. And sun, Kathleen says. Go ahead. Oh, those are all great answers, everyone. And you're exactly right. Now, our buoys, they don't have 
skin or eyes or ears or even fingers to see the water or the sun or feel the sun's rays on, on the skin. So instead, we have equipment and sensors that take those observations for us and send the information back to us at the buoy center. These observations, as I'll continue to call them, uh, support weather forecasters, support the maritime commerce or, or recreational boaters. If you own a boat or have a friend that owns a boat, you, you may get weather reports from some of our stations, as well as scientists. So below you can check out our website, which we'll, we'll visit later in the presentation. So take a look at a map, and all these yellow diamonds are National Data Buoy Center buoys. Okay, and we'll take a look at the three major networks or three major types of buoys that we maintain. So let's start with the TAU or the Tropical Atmosphere and Ocean buoys. There are about 55 of these located along the equator in the Pacific Ocean. There's also the DART or what we call the tsunami buoys, and these are located all around the globe. There are about 39 of these in these locations. And lastly, we'll talk about weather buoys. And these are, are focused on weather events out in the ocean, but around the United States. And there are about 106 of these out in the ocean. So as I mentioned, the tropical and atmosphere and ocean array buoys. Uh, there's a picture of one on the right-hand side of your screen. And what this animation is showing us is how the buoy gets put into the water. And you can see that it's collecting observations for wind, maybe water temperature. Um, and then it sits out in the ocean and sends the data to the Iridium satellite. And then that satellite sends the information back to us. And we're gonna go ahead and, and view a video of NDBC or the buoy center putting one of these uh, tropical and atmosphere and ocean buoys into the ocean. So what we start with is the buoy on the stern or the back. Lauren, what we call the deck. Hold on one second. Yep. We're not seeing it yet. Hold on one second. Okay. It takes a second to load. I apologize. Okay. Oh, that's all right. Okay. okay. Now we're seeing it. Then you just have okay. to hit play. Thank you, Nicole. Yep, so this is a video of one of those tropical and atmosphere and ocean buoys on the back deck or the stern floor of a ship. And you can see that there are technicians lifting up this buoy and putting it off the back of the ship and into the ocean. Now attached to the bottom of that buoy are some sensors. I'll play it again. And you can see those on the deck of the ship and how they're being very careful with putting this in the water to make sure that those sensors uh, don't get damaged and we can get good observations. Okay. That looks like a nice sunny, calm day out at sea. Okay. Next we will look at the tsunami buoys. There's a picture of one of our tsunami buoys on the left-hand side of your screen. And the animation... Oh. <laughs> give, us, give us one second. We're not seeing anything yet. Hold on. I'm, so, I'm yeah. really excited to be talking with you all today. So. <laughs> okay. All right, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. So this animation shows that there's some kind of seismic event, maybe an earthquake that causes some kind of surface wave and this sensor at the bottom of the ocean down here measures that wave measures the pressure and the height of that wave as it passes over the sensor sends information to this surface buoy of the, that looks like the picture on the left hand side and then that information goes to the iridium commercial satellite and then brings the information back to several tsunami centers around the United States. We have another neat video to share with you today is this animation where just off the coast of Japan back in the year 2011 there was an earthquake which caused a tsunami wave to propagate or spread as you see here across the Pacific Ocean. It touched uh, the Alaskan Islands, it touched Alaska, 
and it continued across the Pacific to touch the west coast of the United States. So you can see just how much distance these tsunami waves cover and how um, it could be a really big event. And so we have these 39 tsunami buoys located all around the world to try and detect and give some advance warning um, to save life and property. Next, we'll talk about our weather buoys, which uh, if you see the picture on the left-hand side of your screen, that's one of our weather buoys. And it collects observations from out in the ocean. And if you combine those observations and you add them to uh, like this middle picture is a satellite imagery, or you can add the observations from the buoy to uh, a model, and you'll get what we see on the right-hand side of the screen, which is a marine forecast. It tells you what the weather is doing in that uh, particular area at the time, and also what you may expect to see in terms of weather for the next day and two days and, and whatnot. So that's why it's pretty important for, for mariners to know what the weather is doing in their area. And here we have another really neat video to share with you. So give me a second while I pull that video up. And what you'll be seeing is a deployment or uh, one of our buoys being put into the ocean. And a shout out to the United States Coast Guard. Uh, they're one of our partners and help us out a lot with servicing our buoys and putting these buoys out in the ocean. So we can see one of our weather buoys um, being deployed from the ship into the ocean with a crane. And then they release the hook. And now the buoy is free and ready to collect data out in the ocean. Hey, Lauren, before you turn off that video, um, okay. Nicole, are you still there? Oh, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> Dahlia was asking, um, what is that little white thing spinning around on top of the buoy that's still on the ship? Oh, that's a good question, Dahlia. So that spinning sensor or um, anemometer, as we call it, that collects wind speed and wind direction. So it moves with the with the wind and can tell us how fast it's moving too. Good question. Great, thank you. Thank you. So something I wanted to share with you today, which we think is really neat, is that there are certain weather buoys out in the ocean that have been providing observations and data from that spot for over 30 years. So you can see these red diamonds, and those are the buoys, the weather buoys that have been in that location for over 30 years. And you can see that there are quite a few in the Great Lakes area. Okay, we'll take a break for some questions. All right, thanks, Lauren. This is Nicole from the chat box. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, first, um, Jasper is curious about how big the buoys are. Oh, Jasper, they are very big. We say that they're three meters wide. That's about 10 feet. So imagine maybe three of you standing on your shoulders. That's how wide they are. They're um, some a little smaller, some a little bigger, but they're about 10 feet wide. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, <laughs> let's see. So I am hearing from a few people that want to know about how we service the buoys. Um, and I think we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, we will. So I'll have to save that question. And if I don't touch on it to your, uh, to your liking, bring it back up later. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, Let's see, so the other question we have is, uh, Joseph would like to know, how deep is the water for the Tau buoys? Oh, that's a really good question. And we will look at one buoy in particular, and maybe that'll give you an idea of how deep the ocean is. So hold on to that oh. question. Oh yeah, that's right. And um, okay, and then we got a question from Quinn, who wants to know if all of the buoys stay in the water year round. Some do and some don't. Uh, the Great Lakes tends to freeze, and so we try and take some of those buoys out of the Great Lakes to keep them from um, damaging or, or breaking. And so some of those come out in the wintertime, but yep, other buoys, they'll, the Tau, the 
the tropical atmosphere and ocean buoys, the tsunami buoys, and the weather buoys, they stay in year round. Great. Um, and Michelle in Hawaii wants to know how much do buoys weigh? Oh, that's a great question. Um, on average, they're about 3,500 pounds. Wow, that is huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and and uh, Carol wants to know, do the buoys travel from where they're deployed? They don't. And Carol, that's a good question. We'll touch on why they don't move here in a minute. So stay tuned. All right. It sounds like we've got a lot of questions that you're going to get to. So let's let's move on. Okay. Well, thank you for all of your questions. Those are great ones. Okay, so we'll look back at this map of just the buoy center buoys out in the ocean. And we'll look at this one weather buoy in particular. This is buoy number 46006. And can anybody tell me just by looking at where this buoy is on the map, what ocean, go ahead and type it in the box, what is the name of the ocean that this buoy is located in? All right, so. Theodore quickly says the Pacific, and so does Kelsey. I, I don't think you're gonna oh, be able to fool these kids. They're really smart. No. Yes, you are. You are exactly right. It is the Pacific Ocean. Good job. So if you were to go on our website and take a look at buoy 46006, this is what you would see. You would see that it's owned by or managed by the buoy center, uh, and you would see its coordinates or its location in the Pacific Ocean. Now, someone asked earlier, and I'm gonna ask the question back, how do you think we keep these buoys in one place? Go ahead and type it in the box. Because if you were to sail by on the ocean, all you would see is this buoy on the surface, but we know that they stay in one location, so how do we make it stay? Well, Lauren, uh, Raina thinks that we use an anchor. Is that right? You are correct, Raina. Now, let's take a look at a picture of that buoy attached to an anchor. So if you see on the right hand side of your screen, you have that surface buoy and there's a lot of different equipment below the surface of the water attached to an anchor that you can't see. Let's take a closer look. Okay, buoy 46006 has that surface buoy as we mentioned. And that surface buoy is attached to what we call fish bite rope. And this is because this rope is located towards the surface of the water where you'll find a lot of fish or microorganisms and algae and maybe bigger fish eating littler fish. And sometimes they like to nibble on this section of rope. And if they keep doing that, they may, they may break through and we don't want this buoy to change location. So uh, we use this special kind of rope that uh, is coated with a special coating and it protects the rope from fish bites. Now this fish bite rope is connected to um, shackles and some chain, but then also it's connected to this nylon rope. As you can see in the picture on the right-hand side, it's, it's laid out or what we call uh, flaked out and it's um, spread out. So that way we have the exact amount of rope that we need for this particular station. It is cut to the size that we need for 46006. Now that nylon rope is attached to what we call hydro floats or floats that are these glass balls uh, filled with air and they're covered with a yellow shell that protects them and that keeps the the rope and the chain that's at the bottom of this what we call mooring it uh, keeps it off the bottom and keeps the equipment protected keeps the seafloor protected and then below these floats is an anchor or a weight and some are metal, some are concrete. It depends on which buoy. Now, somebody asked how deep the water was at some of these uh, stations or buoys. And I'm gonna ask you the same question. So if anybody has any ideas, go ahead and type it into the box. If we were to stretch out all this equipment from the buoy through the line all the way to the weight, how much distance do you think it would cover? How long do you think it would be? Okay, let's get some guesses here. So now that Lauren's explained everything that's on there, seems like it would have to be a lot. And we saw a super long rope, says Theodore. So mm -hmm. where he is guessing somewhere between 50 and 100,000 feet, 50,000 and 100,000 feet. Do we have any other guesses? 
Uh, Joseph says 4,500. Um, Raina is more conservative. She thinks it's only 500 to 1,000. Or and Texas thinks it's 4,000. What do we okay. What do we got? Those are really good guesses. This particular buoy has equipment that would stretch out 2.57 miles. That's just over two and a half miles, or just over 4,000 meters. That is the length of 38 soccer fields. A lot of equipment. That is. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your guesses. Now, another question, go ahead and type it in the box. Um, with all this equipment and how much distance it covers and whatnot, how do you think we get all of this equipment from the buoy center out and into the ocean? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I don't think we put it on an airplane. Let's see. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Theodore says it's probably on one big spool, um, but I think we're talking about how are we gonna move all this equipment, Theodore? So yeah. someone says a boat, someone else, a, a lot of people think ships. Um, uh, Eve talks about Coast Guard buoy tenders, so she must know somebody in the Coast Guard. Um, Garrett also yeah. thinks it's a boat. Um, and we've got a few people that think we might helicopter these things in. So maybe you can uh, illuminate. Yeah, let's take a look. We'll start by putting all this equipment on trucks. That was a trick question. So at the buoy center, where if you take a look at my map here, there's the red house icon. That's the location of the buoy center, where we load most of this equipment onto trucks. Then the trucks drive to the location of a boat or a ship that will help us out. That equipment gets put onto the ship, and then the ship sails or uh, motors out to the buoy's location and puts the buoy or um, particular sensors into the ocean. Very good guesses, everyone. Now, we don't just service one buoy at a time. Let's take a look at a particular mission that our technicians uh, completed. So, the top yellow icon uh, is that buoy 46006 that we just showed. And then from there, if you follow that red line down the screen, our technicians and uh, the boat sailed to the top yellow diamond shape there. That shows the topmost um, tropical atmosphere and ocean buoy in that line. And they touched that buoy and they worked their way down that line all the way to that bottom yellow icon and they serviced each buoy along that line. Now, if these buoys are in a line out in the Pacific Ocean, doesn't, you can't really see just from this picture maybe how far of a distance they're sailing on that ship. So imagine going from the topmost to the bottommost uh, tropical atmosphere and ocean buoy. It would be about the same as driving along the entire west coast of the United States, like driving from the state of Washington through Oregon all the way to Southern California. That's as much distance as they covered. So this whole mission, if you follow the entire red line, took about three and a half weeks. They're out to sea for a long time. Now we talked about putting these buoys in the water, the Coast Guard helped us, we have technicians on these ships, but there are a lot of other people that work at NDBC to try and make all of this work happen. So we have scientists and engineers that start with a need. We need to collect information from a particular location and that's why we're gonna put a buoy there. And then there are again scientists and engineers and technicians that talk about, well, what do we need from that spot? What observations do we want to get? Do we need wind speed? Do we need water temperature? Those are all called requirements. And then we have engineers and technicians that work on the computer and they make computer designs to build these buoys and make sure that on the computer everything fits together um, with the design. And then we also have individuals that once those pictures on the computer are drawn, they then build or fabricate all the pieces and parts and equipment that we'll need to put this buoy in the water. Next, we have uh, electronics technicians and also uh, machinery technicians or mechanics 
that then put all of those pieces together or assemble those pieces. And of course, we need to make sure everything works. So we test the individual pieces, the sensors, the equipment, but we also test the entire buoy with all the equipment on it. Make sure everything's good to go and that it'll survive and live out in the ocean for many, many days and years to come. And then we have uh, engineers and scientists and technicians that go back to those computer drawings and maybe something didn't work as well as we thought or maybe we want it to work a little bit better. We can change those drawings to make edits. And as we mentioned before, we have to ship all this equipment to different parts of the country. We then have to deploy or put these buoys in the water. And we have to service them or maintain them. Sometimes things break. We know it. So we go to those buoys and we fix and repair them or, or service them. And last but not least, we have scientists that review those observations or that data when it comes back to NDBC to make sure we're getting good information and good uh, observations to share with scientists and forecasters and mariners. Okay, we'll take a break for more questions. All right, thanks, Lauren. This is Nicole in the chat box. We do have a couple. Um, so Natalie wants to know, uh, in that line of buoys that you showed us, the Tau buoys, mm -hmm. Um, how far apart are they? How much how much distance is between them? That's a that's a good question. So each are at different lines of latitude, and there's one at eight north, five north, two north, the equator, which is zero, two south, five south, and eight south. So that is a distance of um, anywhere between sixty to one hundred and eighty nautical miles between each buoy. Wow. Okay. Um, and Katie asked, how often is service required on the buoys? Well, we start by um, the standard service is one year for most buoys. Some are two years. And if something breaks in between that one or two years, we might make a special trip out to service it. It'll, it'll depend on, on what happens, but standard is about one year. Do we deploy buoys at certain times of year? In other words, do we try to um, time it around, you know, weather and different seasons? Absolutely. In the Great Lakes, we try and uh, make sure we deploy these buoys back into the Great Lakes um, after a lot of the ice has thawed. Um, otherwise, most of the buoys are sitting out in the ocean all year round, so we'll try and and service them uh, during good weather. Sometimes there's a lot of rain when we're servicing the buoys. Sometimes there are big swells or, or big waves and, and we wanna make sure our crew is safe. So we may delay a day for better weather. And um, I wanted to ask, uh, so Alice and Paul in Texas um, ask a question about other buoys that are out there from other organizations. And maybe you can just touch on that quickly because we are not the only ones with buoys out there, right? That is very true. Yep, we only manage about uh, 200 buoys, but there are thousands in the ocean and all across the globe. And, and other buoys might be um, serviced or, or data collected for science, I'm sorry, for universities. So there are buoys that are put out by universities, other, NOAA groups and even other countries have their own buoys. Yeah, someone asked about how many countries participate in the deployment of buoys, but um, I don't know if you have that number at the ready. I don't, I'm sorry, but we'll get to our website where you can see some other buoys from other countries. All right, and our friend Texas in Colorado really likes your, what kind of flags are those behind you? Oh, thank you. These are nautical flags, and each letter of the alphabet has its own um, okay, design, if you will. Us, don't Ooh, tell us. Okay. Texas knows what it says. He thinks it says NOAA NDBC. That is a wonderful guess, and you'd be correct. Yep, it does spell <laughs> NOAA NDBC for NOAA Buoy Center. Very good. <laughs> Great job, Texas. All right, Lauren, I'm going to save. There are some other questions that I think um, Don's going to get to. So let's let's keep moving on. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey, everyone. I will uh, let Dawn introduce herself, and she's going to share some wonderful information with you. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Um, yep. My name is Dawn Petratus. Um, I'm one of Lauren's colleagues at the National Data Buoy Center. My job title is a physical scientist, but my, my training is a meteorologist. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania where I experienced very, very many major weather events such as uh, hurricanes, um, snowstorms, nor'easters, um, and that's actually what got me interested in the weather when I was about 12 years old. So I started following the Weather Channel and I ended up doing a, an eighth grade project where I tracked hurricanes for school. Um, I went, I decided to go to um, Penn State University for my bachelor's degree in meteorology, where I then went on to do my master's degree at Florida State. So all my schooling in total took about six and a half years. Um, once I graduated from Florida State, I started the National Data Buoy Center, where I was doing uh, some of the day-to-day -day work in analyzing the, the data coming from those buoys. I also got the opportunity to go on three TAU service cruises where I earned my buoy hopper title. So you can do very, very exciting things in NOAA. All right, question time. Um, our buoys, each of the buoy systems provide different data, but these real-time events require observations coming to us in real time. So question to everybody is we're going to focus on the trop tropical atmosphere ocean buoys. What does everybody think these buoys provide to us? Okay, so remember these are our eyes and ears out there in the tropical ocean. Um, so what are some of the things that you think these buoys are measuring? Does anybody have any guesses? Okay, so in uh, Alice and Paul think wind speed. Um, Carol says water temperature. Um, what else do we have? Um, Sam says waves. Um, what else do we have here? Keep them coming. Uh, wave height says Raina. Um, Garrett thinks maybe water temperature and heat. Oh, and Jasper came up with humidity. I, I know that's going to be on the list. Um, so let's let's see how we did. All right. Oh, very very good guesses. So let's take a look. We have winds, which somebody mentioned. Um, whoever guessed humidity was very very good guess. Um, I also heard a couple water temperatures on there. Um, we also measure. Um, barometric pressure at a few of those stations. Uh, ocean currents is a big, big deal out in, out in the middle of the ocean to understand where the water's being transported to and from. So we measure that out on select buoys. We also measure precipitation in, in, in the way of, uh, of rain rate or the amount of rain over time. And we can also measure at the, the sun's radiation on some of these buoys. All right, next up, again, question time, is what do you think we measure for our tsunami buoys? And I believe Lauren may have hinted at this earlier. Yeah, so let's think back. Do you remember the, the animation that Lauren showed you about uh, the tsunami? What do we think that uh, the tsunami buoy is looking for? Anybody have an idea? So Michelle right away says, earthquakes, and Raina says wave height, and Anna says wave height as well. All right, yes, very, very, very close, but not quite. It actually measures the water column height above that bottom sensor that's on the bottom of the ocean. So in, in a way, it is measuring a wave height. It's just a very, very, very tall wave height. All right, finally, let's take a guess at what our weather buoys observe and provide to us. All right, so now we're on weather, and I know this all sounds like weather already, um, a lot of the things we've discussed. So let's see, so Joseph says storms. Um, 
wind speed again um temperature air temperature is another guess that we've gotten um and we also got precipitation i wonder if we do that on these buoys as well um barometric pressure says texas um and uh storms is another common guess we got that a few places all right great great guesses all right yep we have pressure we have winds speed and direction um temperature i heard we also this is where we also do our our wave height and direction and we also do water temperature on these stations so a lot of different data from a lot of different sensors and buoys now we're actually going to take a look at the day at a few days in the life of a specific buoy number 41004 during hurricane dorian back in september of 2019. so here we have an image of hurricane dorian on the left and what you see on the map is the uh the winds and how far out those go from the center. The little blue hurricane symbol indicates the hur Hurricane Dorian's track. And you see our nice little buoy 41004 off of the coast of South Carolina. So let's take a closer look at that. All right, so we've zoomed in on the map to see where the hurricane's at, at what time. Um, and we're gonna take a little animation as we go along. So as the video comes. Okay, um, Don, when, Don, make sure when I you, play the video. Yeah, make sure that you unmute yourself, Don. Got it, thank you. <laughs> All right, so as. Okay, un you have to unmute again. Every time it hits play, it's going to um, try and mute you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, all right, Hurricane Dorian is several days out from buoy 41004. And what you see on the, the storm track are the timestamps. And what's, the time is measured in UTC time. What that corresponds to is it's a standard time that scientists use so that everybody around the world knows what time and observation is taken and where things are located. Um, for the east coast of the United States at this point, UTC time is five hours ahead of where we're at. So it is 4.38 p.m. Eastern, so UTC time would be 9.38 p.m. And that changes for each of the um, each of the time zones you, for central time where I'm located, it's 3.38, now 3.39 p.m. And so it would be the standard time stays still 9.39 p.m. Oh, I'm sorry, 8.39. Wow, my math is off today. <laughs> um, okay, so we are two days out from Hurricane Dorian approaching 41004 and we see the weather conditions in the picture on the left and they're very, very calm, nice sunny skies, a few clouds. We're gonna go. And the waves are starting to pick up. I'm sorry, I just realized I was muted again as the yeah. animation. <laughs> yeah, you were. Go ahead and repeat yourself. <laughs> okay, you so. We are now 24 hours out from the hurricane. Um, waves are picking up, as you can see in the picture on the left, and skies are getting gray. And we can see in the panel on the right, the small graph, which we'll show a little bit later, um, it's going, the winds are starting to pick up and the pressure starting to decrease. Okay. Next step, we are just like a couple of hours out from the center of Hurricane Dorian moving right over buoy 41004. You can see very, very high waves. You cannot see the sky. There's a lot of rain and a lot of wind.
And now we are in the center of the storm. As you can see in the picture, there are birds that are stuck in the center of the storm. What happens is these birds get get trapped in the eye of the hurricane and they cannot get make their way out of the hurricane because the winds are too strong on either side of the eye. So what you see on the um, on the left right hand side graph is you see the winds actually go calm in the eye of the storm. And that's where also where we hit the minimum barometric pressure. And just an hour or two later, we are on the other side of the eye of the storm where, again, we have very high waves, we have very high winds and a lot of rain. And you can see on the, the graph on the right, the winds pick up again significantly on the other side of the eye. And finally, we are a day or so later after the hurricane has moved out of the area and you can see waves are now back to relatively calm we have clear skies and our winds are relatively calm as well i love that buoy it's so cool yeah. that yeah. buoy went through a lot <laughs> All right, so this is just a summary of what we, what the buoy observed during the hurricane and after the hurricane. Uh, the hurricane center mentioned that it was a maximum intensity of 100 knots, which was a category three storm. We did notice that the buoy went directly through the center of the storm or the eye. Um, each of the arrows indicates where we saw the minimum or maximum uh, uh, observation. So for pressure, we were down at 959.2 millibars. And the millibars is just a unit of pressure that that we use. Um, there's not a really good way to interpret pressure. For, um, so for uh, for everybody to understand, it's, it's a simple, very, very basic unit. But the winds, however, the highest winds were actually recorded on the backside of the storm. In this case, we were we saw a max maximum wind speed of 85 miles per hour. So that's actually faster than most state speed limits. So if your parents are driving that fast, it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, the maximum wind gust we saw was 99 miles per hour. So we're talking 100 miles per hour, which is relative, which is a lot faster than most most people should ever drive. <laughs> and then I, I mentioned the waves. We had seen the maximum wave height of 24.6 feet. And when you think about it, that's actually taller than most people's houses. So think about a wave from that tall coming at you and it's, it's very, very scary to be in that situation. But these buoys actually provide a lot of insight and help the forecasters determine what's actually going on in these remote and very hard to reach locations. In this case, the National Hurricane Center tweeted out pictures and graphs from 41004 as, as Hurricane Dorian was approaching the station. and. They did note that data from these buoys is extremely, extremely helpful to the forecasters who are trying to determine where and when storms like these, this is, are going to make an impact. So 41004 is famous. Yes, famous. 41004 yeah. is very famous. Oh my God. So I showed you some uh, camera images from 41004 during the hurricane, but we also see other very, very interesting things um, from our buoy camera images. Uh, we see things like birds perched on the top of the buoy. We also see seals playing off of the buoy and out in the water. And then we also see algae patches that float by as just as they're going on by. As, as the water keeps, um, water currents take them. 
And on the upper right hand panel, you see in the red circle, that's actually where we have our buoy cameras installed on the station. So it's a very, very small um, piece of equipment, but that gets very important data to us. All right, Lauren mentioned earlier about our website. So this is our website, www.ndbc.noaa.gov. From here, you can see all sorts of buoys and stations. So we're actually gonna take a look at um, how you can get to things like the buoy camera imagery. And that's in the red circle on the left-hand side of our website. And if you click that, you go to a page like this, and this is a map of where our buoy cameras are actually providing imagery. Um, you can click on one buoy uh, as circled in the red, and what that will do is that'll bring up a page, it'll bring up a zoomed in map, and on the bottom of the page, it'll actually bring up the most recent camera imagery, where you can see things like clouds and birds and maybe some other interesting things. And I will um, take some questions now. Oh, that is very cool. I love knowing that you can just find, so you guys, I'm sure everyone on here is now gonna be looking for all these different buoys and finding all the different camera images. Um, that's really cool. So Don, thank you for sharing the life of 41004. Um, we did get some, we had some very concerned people about that buoy. Um, Garrett wants to know, you know, does it even, do the buoys move in that kind of wind, 95 miles an hour? They they typically don't move. Um, we, as Lauren said, we have a lot of um, equipment below the surface, so they're able. The buoys are actually able to move a little bit, so they're not really tightly anchored to the to the sea floor. So they they're able to move as the high waves and the high winds are are impacting the station. Occasionally, we do have um, storms that do damage to our buoys. We've actually even had a case of a buoy flipped over due to a storm. Um, usually in a hurricane or sometimes it actually happens up in Alaska where you get hurricane like storms up there with the, that that type of strength that can just flip the buoy over so occasionally we do have to go out and fix those state those buoys when they do flip over and incur damage yeah i could i i could see that um so has a hurricane ever destroyed a buoy michelle asks I don't believe a hurricane's actually completely destroyed a buoy. We have had cases where sensors have been damaged. Um, and like I said, we've we've occasionally had the bu buoy flip over and there's been damage because of that. But we've never, we've actually had, we've lost buoys before. <laughs> yeah. It happens. <laughs> How do we find them? So we have a, a piece of equipment and a sensor on board each of the buoys to track their position. Um, just like your phone has a GPS in it, each of the buoys has a GPS on it. Um, and as, as long as that GPS is active and is working, we are able to track the buoy. Um, there are sometimes when that GPS fails and we don't necessarily know where the buoy is located. All right. Well, I know you guys probably don't like to play favorites, but everyone wants to know if you have a favorite buoy. Do either of you have a favorite buoy? Lauren, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tough one. I really like buoy 42001 because it is located in the Gulf of Mexico near where I live and I have a boat. So I like to look at that buoy for weather when I go out on my boat. Oh, that's that's a, that's a good answer, Don. And we didn't even rehearse this. Do you have a favorite buoy? I do actually. My my favorite is one of the tropical atmosphere ocean buoys. It's at uh, zero and one twenty five. So it's on the equator at one at the longitude of one twenty five west. Um, I 
I caught a fish there on one of my trips, and I believe it's actually one of the ones I actually jumped on, so I, where I earned my buoy hopper title. <laughs> Uh, okay, I see. I didn't think that was going to be like a real thing, but clearly my audience knows that um, that you guys must love your buoys. Um, it's it's obvious to me that you love your work, um, but our kids always love to hear what your favorite part of your job is. So um, I don't know, Lauren, do you want to go first? Sure. I love being able to get a request from someone or a group that says, hey, we've noticed this about this station or this buoy, what's going on? And I love being able to answer their question, give them information, and then even more, I like being able to fix that buoy or station for them and get them the information that they want. Great, that's a great answer, Don. Yeah, I think my favorite part is watching the data come in from things like hurricanes and, and big storms. Um, I, I'm a big weather nerd, so I like watching all the extreme data come in and say, ooh, there's high winds, ooh, there's really high waves, ooh, we're getting really, really bad weather at this location now. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big weather nerd. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, before I let you guys go, um, since we put so much emphasis on the photos, are only the live, like the most recent photos or, uh, available online or are um, ones from previous days archived on the website as well? Do you know? Um, unfortunately, I think it's only the most recent available on the website. We haven't be, due to limitations on our website, we haven't made the past um, imagery available. Um, it's definitely something we could consider at some point. So it's great. In answer to your question, Mark, it would be great to look um, during an event. So, you know, go to the website during an event so you can see some of those live images um, during storms and things like that. Well, you guys were great. I'm so excited uh, that we got to talk to you, and we haven't had ever, we haven't had a speaker from Mississippi before, so um, you know we appreciate you showing up from the Gulf Coast for this. And also, um, next week for everybody, we are doing reef fish identification with some folks from the Southeast Fisheries Science Center in Key Biscayne, Florida. So we're just going to move up the Gulf a little bit um, around to the Atlantic and. Uh, I think you guys are really going to like that. So, um, so we'll see you next week. Thank you, Don and, and Lauren and uh, Brenda and Crystal. And everybody have a good week and we'll see you soon.